Stuart, it's great to have you. I always feel a little bit intimidated when uh, I have to interview somebody with the, the name Professor. So you will make, you'll make my job easy, won't you? Yeah, I think so. Good. Whew. Now, um, we, we've advertised you as a, a rocket scientist. Now, that's, you're not a specialist in a type of lettuce, are you? Uh, no. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, so uh, you worked on the European space rocket, I think. Uh, yes, I had a great privilege of working for the European Space Agency, uh, and in particular worked on a spacecraft called Envisat, uh, which was an environmental uh, satellite, a very large uh, satellite. In fact, we had a little joke that one of the reasons we called it Envisat was because it was bigger than every American satellite built by oh, NASA, right. <laughs> and they were very envious, uh, <laughs> so we called it Envisat. And uh, when I go to the States, I often explain that to the audience there. They can't believe that the Europeans have made something bigger than uh, <laughs> the Americans. But it's, it's a huge satellite. It's so big, it wouldn't actually fit in this hall here. It's about 30 meters from one wow. end uh, to the other. But that, that's had a big effect on me working for the European Space Agency because that's where I saw that design does not happen by chance. It's really very difficult, and, and not just a difficult activity, but also an emotional activity as well. Yes, you used a phrase before, I remember you saying that for there to be design, there must be personality, and, and you believe that. But what was your responsibility on the design of the rocket? I was specifically responsible for designing the solar array. The solar array are the uh, panels for collecting energy from the sun, uh, a very critical part of the spacecraft, very large part. Uh, the solar panels were about the size of a badminton court. And I remember the manager for the whole project calling me in and saying, Stuart, do you realize that the spacecraft cost $2 billion? And I said, I didn't realize that. And he said, do you realize there's only one solar array? I said, well, of course, I realize that. I'm designing it. Then he said, do you realize that if your solar array does not deploy within 60 minutes of launch, the whole mission is dead? And I said, I didn't know that. And he said, if I could remember that for the rest of the project, he would appreciate uh, <laughs> that. So no pressure. <laughs> it was huge pressure. And so on, on the day of launch, uh, I felt physically sick. Uh, did you? Uh, and it's one of those things they don't teach you when, when you're at university being taught engineering and design. Uh, they don't tell you about the pressure and some of those situations that you cannot uh, prepare for. But that really taught me that design is difficult, it's a very emotional activity, and I wish that some people like Richard Dawkins, evolutionists like that, who say, oh, the world could just evolve by chance very easily, if they could just try and design something, because most of them have never designed anything, and if they could try to design something complicated, I think they would have a different view about uh, their faith in chance. Mm, interesting. Um, when you were a child, Stuart, were you the sort who was always doodling and sort of creating things on paper from your imagination? Uh, well, I had a bit of a difficult childhood, so I didn't get on very well at school, but I would say the one thing which I really enjoyed as a child, a bit of escapism, was Lego. I did have access did you? to Lego, and looking back, that was definitely inspirational and uh, had a big influence on me for you know, wanting to do engineering. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, if I may, just, um, just investigate a little bit about your childhood. Just tell us about your home. I know it's quite sensitive, but I think it's very fascinating to understand you. Tell us how you grew up, what, what was home like? Uh, well, I had um, quite a disruptive childhood. I was one of five children, uh, that, and, and there was two, uh, two stepsisters, one stepbrother and one brother. Um, both of my stepsisters were taken into care. Uh, they, they were fostered, so was one of my brothers. My other brother went to a special school, so I was actually on my own. Uh, so I was brought up by my mother, so single parent family. And that, so that was quite disruptive, and we moved a lot. I changed school uh, a lot. And also, in, in the times when I was at school, in the 70s, um, there was quite a bit of bullying for people uh, who had school meals and uh, we were taken care of by the social system. 
So I find a bit of prejudice and bullying, and so I find school quite difficult. Mm. And I think you were even in special needs, weren't you, for a period? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in my second year of school, I was actually in a special needs section for learning to read and write. Amazing. Yeah. Have you ever gone back to the teachers and said, na, 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 na? <laughs> <laughs> I have bumped into one or two teachers who <laughs> uh, have been a bit surprised. Have yeah. they? Amazing, yeah. isn't it? Wonderful. But, but nevertheless, it shows the influence a teacher can have as well. Yes. Yeah. So, so that was your school life. Did you enjoy going home or did you dread going home after school? Uh, I'd, yeah, I think I did. Yeah, th 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 there was a lot of sadness, but I didn't really know a lot different. Mm. Uh, so I think it would have been worse if I'd known a lot about what it could be like mm. uh, to, to have a happy childhood. So when I look back, it's like, in many ways, I didn't have a childhood when I see other children having a childhood today. Mm. But... Yeah, I didn't resent so much because I didn't know there was anything else. Mm. And you left school at, what, 16? Yes. And what, yeah. got an apprenticeship or...? That's right, an apprenticeship with Stotherton Pit, a very good uh, company in the city of Bath, making cranes. Okay. And there, there I had a good time. Uh, so what was this, mechanical engineering? Yes. Yeah. And, and you were being trained in that. And, uh, did they sort of spot that there's somebody with exceptional ability here? Uh, yeah, um, they said that if anyone did really well, there might be the chance of university. Uh, after two years, they said the chances were very, very slim. But then, uh, when I was 18, two weeks before the beginning of term, they suddenly said, there's a university place, would you like to go? Mm. And they said, what university would I like to go to? And I just didn't know anything about any university. Mm. So everything happened very fast. And you went to where? I went to Brunel University in Uxbridge in London. Right. And well, how did your mother feel about that? Well, at that time, I was becoming a bit estranged uh, yeah. from my mother. Uh, she'd married for a third time, and my stepfather didn't like me, uh, and I had two hours' notice to leave home. So I was thrown out of home. Really? And Brunel, tell us about your... Well, you studied what? Design engineering, did you? Uh, it was actually mechanical engineering okay. at Brunel University. Uh, when I started, I felt very lonely because uh, all of my student colleagues, they would go home at half-term or Christmas time uh, to be with their parents, or their parents would visit. But I was there very much on my own. I felt quite cut off uh, from my family. So during vacation, what, did you stay at the university? Did you? Yes, mm. yeah. But you obviously did fairly well. I found the first year hard because I'd only done night school from 16. So I had to work uh, incredibly hard in my first year just Sorry, to did you, did you say you worked and yet you were at university? Oh, right, I didn't realise people did that. Yeah, in fact, it's, in, fact you, in fact, you're not allowed to do that. No, not these no. days you're not allowed to. No, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, half my... Anyway, yes. Yeah. Um, OK, so you were unique. You were you're working at university. But I think, um, Stuart, it was there... Was it for the first time you really came across Christianity? Yeah, that was the first time. Uh, I had a friend in my course in my first year, uh, Graham Studden, and he invited me to a Christian Union meeting. Uh, which I found just absolutely fascinating. I'd Did never you? heard the gospel. I'd never really read the Bible uh, at all. And especially because I felt lonely, I was really interested to see what these Christians believed and, and, and what it was like to interact so with So if them. I'd met you as a 15-year-old, say, and said, Stuart, do you believe in God? What would you have said? I would have thought and said, I don't know. I would have been an agnostic. Would you? But yeah. did you think about those things at all? I did. Uh, I often thought that there must be more to life than just eating, playing sport. There was a kind of emptiness in my heart that, that I definitely noticed. All right, so you went along to the Christian Union and enjoyed it. And, and then what? How did it proceed? I was immediately struck by the character of these people. They were completely different to other people on my course. And so I was really interested to go to a local evangelical church. It was actually a brethren church yeah. in Uxbridge and as soon as I went there I really appreciated the preaching and some of the first sermons related to God as creator and the book of Genesis and I found it very easy to believe that there was a creator I didn't have any difficulties with that at all perhaps being an engineer helped me with that mm. but then of course 
then quickly, uh, I was challenged by the idea that I'm accountable to a creator. And even though I'd had a difficult childhood, I never thought that that was an excuse for my past behaviors, thoughts, and actions. And so I did really feel convicted of sin. And very soon I repented and I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you were, what, 18, 19 years of age? Yeah, 19 by then. 19. And, and Stuart, did you notice any difference that Jesus or becoming a Christian made to you? The first thing I noticed and really appreciated was the church family at this Brethren Church because it was the first time that I'd seen a functioning family. And that was the thing that witnessed to me most of all. Mm. Uh, there, was, uh, there was great love. There was one particular family, the Helden family in Uxbridge, who opened their home to me. I would go along there Sunday by Sunday. Free student meal. Yes, but more important than that was the love that they showed. Uh, there was one day when the mother, Mrs. Helden, she hugged me and I just burst into tears because oh. I'd never known that affection before. So, Stuart, it, without being critical, w would you say your mother wasn't able to love you? Or? I think she did love me, but uh, she had so many difficulties and problems and distractions. Um, but particularly when my stepfather came, mm. I, I just had to be thrown out. And Later she said sorry for that, but at the time she was under a lot of pressure. So there you are in a Christian home, and you burst into tears because of the affection. Did they understand why, what, why, I don't know, just family life meant so much to you, do you think? Uh, I think they, they seemed to understand that quite well, and the parents, because they, they had four children, similar age to me, in one sense the parents were grateful because every week I would send a thank you letter, every single week, mm. and they would show those to their children. <laughs> This and is how say, to do it. <laughs> this visitor doesn't stop writing thank you letters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you graduated, and then, then did you go back to the mechanical engineering company in Bath? I did. I went back to Stoffers and Pitt. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, uh, Robert Maxwell took over the company and closed it down. Oh, did uh, So I had to leave. Uh, but then I went back to Brunel's to do a PhD in London. You weren't tempted to push Robert Maxwell off a boat, were you? <laughs> no. no, it wasn't you, okay. No. Um, uh, all right, so you went to do a PhD in what? That was in engineering design, looking at a one-way clutch mechanism. So that's where I got into researching mechanisms. Right. We're already going a little bit beyond my understanding, but it sounds impressive. And then you became an academic. Then I went back to Bristol to work for British Aerospace, where I worked for the European Space Agency uh, for right. five years, just right. over five years. And then after that, I went to Cambridge University for just over three years to be an assistant director of research. Yeah, amazing. Now, you're a Christian. You, you, you've already referred to the Bible. You believe the Bible. Absolutely. But you are a scientist. Yes. But now, Stuart, you're well aware that many people would, would sort of just have the preconceived notion that how can you be a Christian and yet also a scientist, or vice versa? How can you be a scientist and a Christian? And you've mentioned Dawkins. He sort of gives the... Well, no, he doesn't give the impression. He's very blatant about it. it. It's an impossibility to hold both positions. So how do you, I don't know, balance being a Christian with being a scientist? Well, I certainly make no apology. Uh, the greatest scientists who ever lived were Christians. Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, uh, Maxwell... Uh, Lord Calvin, uh, and Michael Faraday, and so on. So uh, we're certainly not in a minority. And also, I'm surprised how many academics are at least sympathetic to intelligent design. But I certainly see no contradiction between biblical creation and science. Now, Stuart, you say you're surprised how many are sympathetic to... That is not the impression that we get in the media at all, is it? That's absolutely correct. Uh, I even bump into senior biologists in my university who actually don't even believe in the theory of evolution. And I say to them, and, and many of them are not Christians, and I say to them, why don't you tell the media that? Because the media are saying no biologists down to evolution. But they say they won't admit it because they will be persecuted, they'll be bullied, they might be sacked or demoted. 
Uh, so sadly, science isn't open in this area. So they're, despite their pursuit of academic honesty, you're saying they're sort of being intimidated into a silence? Sadly, there, there is intimidation. Do you get, you, so you're now a professor at Bristol University. Yes. Do you, do you get intimidation? Are you, well, let's use the word again, bullied in any way? Uh, yeah, I get uh, a lot of attacks, particularly from atheist organisations like the Brights. Uh, there's another atheist organisation called the British Centre for Science Education. Just to give you one example, that organisation has sent letters to every head of department at Bristol University uh, claiming, telling them that I say that they work for the devil, stirring up trouble. Have you ever said that? I've never said that, but no. the... the and I didn't know they did that when they, when they actually did that. The first I knew was when Sir Michael Berry, a very famous uh, professor at Bristol University, he emailed me and he said, Stuart, is it right that you think I work for the devil? And when I received that email, I was just astonished. And mm. I spoke with him and then he explained that the British Centre for Science Education had sent this accusation to him. And when I had a discussion with him mm. and he realised they were just stirring up trouble, he was very sympathetic to me and, and uh, he, he was very surprised at, at what this organisation had done. In fact, the whole thing backfired because uh, he ended up coming to my inaugural lecture. Oh, and yeah. all of my engineering colleagues were very jealous that Sir Michael Berry came to my <laughs> inaugural lecture. And what, what was the theme of your inaugural lecture? It was the design of the Envisat satellite. Right. Uh, I actually called it, the, the type of my lecture was Impossible Design because uh, I was explaining how difficult it was to design that spacecraft. Uh, so that attack actually backfired. Mm. Uh, but I wasn't able to speak to all the other heads of department who had the same mm. accusation. So there's a cost to being a Christian who's seeking to be consistent and yet being a scientist as well. Um, I just want to ask you exactly what you do believe. So there are very sort of basic Christian beliefs. We believe that there is one God. Yes. And this God brought all things into being, created the world. Mm -hmm. You believe that? Yes. Now, in Genesis, it says that God created the world in six days. Do you believe in a six-day creation? I do. And I don't find that difficult uh, because if God has the power to bring energy and matter out of nothing, that great miraculous power, and if he has the incredible wisdom to create a myriad of flying creatures and other incredible creatures, then he easily has the power to create in six days. Basically, I have a very high view of God, mm. uh, a view that he is just awesome in power and wisdom. And because of that, uh, I don't find that difficult. People say to me, well, how can you explain uh, how the world could be made in six days? And doesn't it look old in some ways? And the basic answer I give is that uh, God has designed a mature creation. So the trees in the Garden of Eden would have been mature. Adam and Eve would they have They weren't looked... acorns, were they? They weren't seeds, they were, they were trees. Exactly. Yeah. Adam and Eve probably would have been, say, 21, the best kind of age. No, I would have thought 65. But <laughs> yes. No, 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 it's, it's definitely 21. <laughs> but, but of yeah. course, they would have been a day old. But so God created a mature creation. Mm. Actually, that's a familiar concept to an engineer because engineers sometimes create mature systems. When we create a motor car, even if it's brand new, it's fully functioning, ready to function very well, and it may not look brand new, but it's made as a fully functioning system. So mm. the whole concept of a mature creation is, is, is not challenging to me. Mm. Uh, do you believe that God has revealed himself then through it, the written word, the Bible? you believe this is God's message to humanity? Absolutely, and it's important because even though the created world reveals so much about God, his power, wisdom, his goodness, and his care, it's a very important witness, but it doesn't reveal everything, and we absolutely need the Bible uh, to reveal other things, his mercy and his grace, and most of all, it reveals his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's come into this world. Well, I was going to ask that. So you, you believe that Jesus is God incarnate, God coming into our world, clothing himself in humanity? Absolutely, yes. Uh, in, in many ways, that's the message of the Star of Bethlehem. This was a special birth and a special saviour. So you have no problem with the idea of a, spa, a star guiding the wise men to where Jesus was born? 
I've just written a book on it and it's been advertised from yesterday. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> and and so the answer to the question yeah. is, no, you don't have a problem with it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah. Just tell us, if we don't buy the book in a sentence, what is it saying? Uh, it's saying that there are really important lessons for today from the Star of Bethlehem. Today, so much of society is looking for extraterrestrial life, looking for star signs, but forgetting that God has given the one important star sign that we need to consider. That's the star of Bethlehem. Mm. And there is one kind of extraterrestrial who has visited the earth, and that's the Lord Jesus. That's where people need to put their attention. Interesting. Now, do you believe that we're saved through faith? Because this is quite distinctive for Christianity. Whereas world religions would say we have to do things, try to be good, improve ourselves, etc. And we may earn favor with God or the gods, whatever. But with Christians, we say, no, no, no. We could never earn favor with God, but he has come to rescue us. Do you believe that? I do. I mean, I do believe that God's laws are important. Uh, as a response to God's love, I try to keep the commandments. But keeping the commandments is hard, and every day I fall short, and uh, it would be impossible for me to earn salvation. Uh, otherwise, God would not need to send the Lord Jesus to live a perfect life. We absolutely uh, need that gift of faith to be saved. Mm. Um, can I ask you about prayer as well? Do you pray? Yes. Uh, is, is it? But yeah. is it? A psychological crutch? Is it a way of just sort of meditating, bringing calm and peace, you know? Uh, do, do, you, do you actually believe you're speaking to the creator, the mighty maker God? Prayer is so important, and it's one of the things that is so important in our spiritual lives. Uh, if, if you're not a Christian, what a kind of crude engineering analogy I give, it's like being a motor car locked in a garage. You're not doing what you're designed to do. But if you're a Christian, you're able to do this amazing thing, speak to God through prayer. And it's absolutely powerful. You can see that in the Bible. Amazing things are done through prayer. So I see prayer as a really vital part. Uh, it's something that can uh, cause miracles to, to, to happen in life. And, and yet we, we always, again, get the sort of impression, probably from the media, I don't know, that scientists are self-sufficient. They don't need to be able to pray. But you're saying, no, no, in your life, that's not the case. Science can do great things, but science is limited. Scientists cannot make a single blade of grass. And that's a very humbling thing when you realize that I've worked with some of the best designers in the world, designers at NASA in the United States, designers at Panasonic, and they were good designers. Worked with the best designers in Europe, the European Space Agency. Uh, but none of them begin to compare with what God has designed and produced in creation. Uh, so what we produce in science and engineering is just nothing compared with what God can do. And yet there does seem the possibility that they might be able to create life? I don't think so. <laughs> um, because, not to, go on. Uh, to, uh, scientists have tried to create life in the lab over the last 60 years. They've had the best equipment. They've tried countless times, but they cannot uh, create life just from lifeless chemicals. Uh, I've spoken to a really senior uh, professor of microbiology at my university, who's not a Christian, and I said to him, what do you think of the theory of abiogenesis, that you can create life in the lab? And he said, it's black magic, it's utter rubbish. Really? And he's not a Christian, and he's a professor of microbiology. And he said what Christians believe makes far more sense, because it's impossible to create life in the lab. Um, without breaking any confidences, you're obviously talking with people that I don't actually usually sit next to on the bus in Leeds. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, do, they, do they open up about the sort of issues that they face, the problems that we all face? Do you find that sometimes you know, these people who seem to have got it all together, actually, when they're talking with you, open up and say, I am vulnerable. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really encouraged uh, by my conversations in academia with my colleagues. I find them very friendly. My own university is a very good university. I have one particular friend, at another microbiologist who's not a Christian, and he's so sympathetic to my ministry. Uh, he's very friendly. Uh, in fact, this year, I, had, I bumped into him in the gardens at my university, and he said, 
Stuart, I think evolution is a bit like a magic wand. We wave this wand and we say, evolution did it. Mm. We can't explain how evolution did it. We just have faith that evolution did it. And I told him that was so remarkable because even biblical creationists hadn't thought of that expression. <laughs> he thought of it yeah. himself. Uh, but he said that the problem, as he sees it, the problem with science, it doesn't like big changes. It has to go in a certain direction. And if most people uh, believe in evolution, you, it's hard to change that status quo. Even though lots of people doubt it, they don't want to stick their head above the parapet. And they don't want to rock the boat. It's best just to let everything keep going in that direction. Can you, is there any scientific dis discovery that you could imagine in the worst moment that would make you doubt your faith? If they could create life out of lifeless chemicals, that would. However, it's not going to happen. So life can't come from non-life. Yes. Yeah, you, you need, it's often been said, you need more faith to believe that than to believe the Bible. And I think in a sense that's very true. Mm, okay. Can I ask you about the future? Um, does the future and possible scientific discoveries, etc., does it worry you? Uh, I, I'm, I think science uh, can be a very good thing and scientific discoveries uh, is very exciting. I think in the area of, of medicine and playing around with genes uh, and human embryos, that side of things does worry me. Mm. Mm. Um, what are you working on at the moment? What are you researching at the moment? I'm working with Team GB. I've just uh, oh, cycling, Team GB sport. cycling. <laughs> Right. Um, <coughs> I've just redesigned their chain transmission for the Rio de Janeiro Olympics in Brazil. Uh, but what, the bicycle chain? Yes. So you're using this phenomenal brain of yours to work on a bicycle chain? Uh, but winning gold medals oh, and okay. beating the Americans at that is just as important <laughs> as right, spacecraft. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what have you done? What have you come up with? Well, there might be Americans listening, oh, so I, I cannot there tell are. you. There are. <laughs> yes, there are. We have spies. <laughs> okay, amazing. Basically, different subtle designs to make the, the system more efficient. If you could design a bicycle chain that when it comes off, you can put on without getting your hands dirty, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> but, uh, all right. Um, you're married? Yes. Children? Yeah, I have five children. Five children. How old are they? The eldest is 25, I think, <laughs> and the youngest is 16. Right. Are you one of these absent-minded professors who doesn't remember his wedding anniversary? Uh, I do remember it's on the 1st of October, convenient <laughs> date. <laughs> All right, OK. I think my um, wife's watching. So. <laughs> yes, OK. Um, Stuart, if one of your children turned round and said, Dad, I'm sorry, I just can't follow you in your simple Christian faith, how would you feel? Well, first of all, we've always said to our children, it's up to them what they believe. We can't uh, force them to. Secondly, uh, I think it's important to be patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. And patience is the first in that long list of attributes of true love. Yeah. I, there are lots of people who take lots of time to come to the Lord. Uh, I've witnessed to people and often... In the first few months, there is a, a rejection of the things I've said. But it's surprising how often after a few months, people will come back and say, yeah, I can see there is evidence for design, or I can see the Bible may be correct in this area. So mm. patience is key. Mm. You might be able to help me on this. I don't know how many times somebody has said to me, um, hey, I'm a scientist. You know, I just don't believe. How do you respond when somebody says that to you? I say, uh, I'm not surprised. We live in a secular society that there's a lot of unbelief. But I would encourage them to consider the evidence. And there is so much evidence. Uh, I've written lots of books with we are good to talk hundreds about these, of yes. examples of evidence. Just looking at the human body uh, is a good starting point. Uh, and I say to them, I believe we're over-designed. We're designed for much more than survival. Our ability to do things like sing, you know, if you hear a beautiful Welsh choir singing beautifully, that's very hard to explain from an atheistic uh, viewpoint. But if, wh Why is it, sorry? Why do you need to sing beautifully in order to survive? 
why would you not survive if you could not sing beautifully? Mm. Whereas our ability to sing beautifully is just what you'd expect if God had designed us. And you can go through hundreds of examples, our ability to write, our ability to play music, our ability to do craft work, our ability to have emotion, appreciate beauty, all of these areas we are over-designed. And a key principle of evolution is that a system should only be designed enough just to survive, and yet we are clearly over-designed. So mm. that's where I would start with a skeptical scientist. And Very often it gets them thinking. Mm. Now, can I just talk about your books? Because uh, I'm not just advertising. You've brought lots, so we can, yeah. we can purchase them. But I'd like you just to talk through them a little bit. I think, was this your first one, Hallmarks of Design? Yeah, that's my first book that was um, published in 2000. Evidence of Purposeful Design and Beauty in Nature. So what is it about? Is it going along the lines you've just spoken about? It focuses on some of the most beautiful parts of creation. Bird song, uh, bird feathers... Uh, flowers, uh, the parts of creation that are probably least affected by the fall, where we see great intricacy of design and great beauty. Mm, okay. And then I think your second book was He Made the Stars Also, which is actually a phrase, isn't it, from Genesis chapter 1, yes. uh, yep. what the Bible says about the stars. So yes. are you an astronomer as well? Well, I, I did work a little bit on the Hubble Space Telescope, so that gave me an interest okay, that, Do you in know that's astronomy. a sentence I've never said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, so tell us more, yes. Well, I'm very happy to say that Hubble Space Telescope has revealed great design and beauty in the universe. So the first half of the book uh, summarizes some of the great evidences of design that have come out, the clockwork motion of the solar system and the positioning of the stars and planets so well positioned to bring life on the earth. But the second half of that book deals with the question of extraterrestrial life and what the Bible teaches about do you, that. Do you think that we could ever find life, say, on, on some planet or, I don't know, some distant galaxy has life? I don't think we will because the Bible teaches that the earth is at the centre of God's purposes in the universe. God uh, took three days to designed the earth and yet only one day was taken to design the stars of the rest of the universe and we're told that the stars are made to shine light on the earth so the universe is obviously earth centered in a spiritual sense hmm. and then um, the design and origin of man evidence for special creation and, and over design which is what you did so go on tell us a bit more well this book summarizes 10 unique features uh, of the human being. Ten things that make us very special, uh, things like our upright stature, our hands are unique, our skin, our facial expressions are unique, our voice, our childhood, um, uh, our, our brains and our spirituality. These are things that make us unique. Being an engineer, I tend to look in a top-down way, looking at our, the things that we can do. And in that sense, I argue that we're totally different to apes and chimpanzees. Mm. Now, you've brought some um, a DVD, Refracted Glory, and it's about the hummingbird, is that right? Yes. So, go on, tell us more. Well, there's lots of beautiful footage of amazing hum hummingbirds in there, and uh, I'm one of several presenters, but on my section, I do present my work on micro-air vehicles, where I've copied the design of dragonflies and hummingbirds to produce an engineering version of a small flying machine. Right. <laughs> Absolutely fine. Now, you would sign these, wouldn't you? If we buy them, you'd sign them. And if we run out, yeah. I think we could probably all get some more ordered. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart, do you see yourself as a Christian who is a scientist or a scientist who is a Christian? I'm, I, I see myself almost as a Christian. Uh, right. And uh, especially... Because of my interest in biblical creation, I give talks uh, on evidence for design around the world. Uh, and uh, I'm very much helped in my work because I deal with principles of design in my research and my teaching. And that helps me to appreciate the Bible more. It helps me to appreciate God's work in creation all the more. So I'm, I feel very blessed that there's this complementarity in my work and my belief. Mm. Do you know, I'd love to carry on asking questions. Absolutely fascinating. I've never asked anybody this before, but do you do a blog? Uh, I haven't had time. 
What a shame. <laughs> I think many of us would love to follow that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't read anybody else's blog, but if you start one, I'll, I'll subscribe, OK? OK, thank you. Uh, but you will be around afterwards to chat, yes. won't you? Yeah, yeah. Stuart, thank you so much. Shall we show our appreciation? Thank you.